Morning all. Uh, I know we started at 11, but I just going to give it a couple more minutes just because it, sometimes uh, people are a little bit late in joining. So uh, bear with me a little bit and I'll be back on in a couple of minutes of time. Thank you. Three minutes past, let's go. Um, some people are still joining me, but we are recording this event anyway, and we will circulate it on uh, YouTube uh, later on today. So, first of all, thank you for taking the time to pop along and listen to me wobble on about Brexit. Uh, and secondly, thank you for your perseverance, because I messed up the link this morning, so the fact that you've even made it here is something of a miracle. I'm having a, a week from hell at the moment, having, first of all, messed up some of the text on the advert in the Times. Uh, I've now managed to kill the link for the live event. So uh, thank you for persevering and getting this far. You are truly intrepid. Um, okay, um, what I'm going to go through here are the changes that have taken place this week. Um, this is completely up to date and includes those changes, uh, and also the, uh, the the changes that are happening uh, next year with regard to GBMS, for example, because I think that's one of the biggest changes that's going to affect everything. So stick with me, uh, we'll see how we get on. And uh, if there are any questions, that you'll see a link coming up on the uh, slides anyway, where you can actually send questions. But I'm not kind of doing a live Q&A, because we tend not to, I, I do a lot of these, and the live Q&As, there's never enough detail. So if you have a question, then email it in, and uh, our team will respond to you fully. So without further ado, let's crack on. Um, first of all, I wanted to update the phased approach slide. Um, which is one we've worked on all the time. Obviously, let's change the date at the top now because everything keeps moving on. But let's just refresh our memories of what, where we are, what's, what's coming, uh, and also what's changed this week. So first of all, let's do number one, which is GB Exports. GB Exports hasn't changed at all. It went live on the 1st of January this year. It's still live. Uh, people who are having problems are still having problems. And on the whole, people, uh, traders have got kind of used to the processes and, and equally so the European agents got used to the processes. So it's kind of where it is now. Um, it's also where GB is going. So bear in mind that if you think exports is complicated, you know, imports could end up being equally complicated if you don't do it right. So number one, full Brexit on GB exports has been there from day one. 
And number two is the is the imports, GB imports from, from the EU, this is, uh, are relaxed until the end of the year. And when I say relaxed, I mean that there is no real frontier piece uh, unless you're coming into an inventory linked port. Uh, the, the, the relaxation is the fact that there is a declaration requirement, but it's not particularly linked to the frontier. And I'll show you within these slides how that changes next year. Uh, there were some relaxations and some further easements announced earlier on this week, uh, which is a frantic day of updating everything. Um, SPS, for example, on IPAPS, which I'll come to in a minute, has been pushed further down the line. Uh, Full imports hasn't. Full imports was due to start on the 1st of January 2022 and still is starting on the 1st of January 2022. And that also has slightly tougher rules of origin requirements, which I'll cover as well uh, in this in a future slide yeah, in this presentation. Um, the thing is that the deferred entry scheme is still running uh, where you have up to 175 days to submit your declaration. So there'll be a kind of a, an unusual overlap where anything that comes in in January either has to be uh, declared at the frontier or by the fourth working day of February if you're using uh, simplifications. Whereas anything that came in in December, you actually have until, until June to submit that declaration. So there's this unusual six month overlap or maximum six month overlap. Um, that said, not many people seem to be using the deferred entry scheme, or certainly not as many as HMRC would have thought, and equally neither did I. You know, it's not as many as I would have thought. But, uh, I'll cover that again in a bit as well because I'm not sure everyone's doing it right. <laughs> um, so imports is not relaxed. It's well, it is relaxed currently, but it's not been further. It's not been kicked further down the road. It is starting on the first of January. SPS is where the difference is. SPS is sanitary and phytosanitary, so products of origin, plants, food and feed, uh, and plant products, you know, root vegetables and what have you. Um, they the IPAPS was due to start in October, that's been pushed back, although DEFRA were ready, we were ready, I have to say, DEFRA um, were ready, as they um, reiterated three or four times on the recent BPDG meeting, or the recent BPDG call, uh, DEFRA were at great pains to say that they were completely ready. Uh, it, in the end, it was a ministerial decision to push it further down the line because of the supply chain issues uh, related to driver shortages, media coverage, empty shelves, this type of thing. The last thing you want to do is put pressure on the inbound supply chain of food. Um, so that's been that's been delayed. Uh, nothing changes until the end of the year. From January onwards, uh, the IPAS declaration is required, which is the pre-notification. For those familiar with uh, this, this sort of processes, it's very similar to Traces, uh, which is the European uh, tracking system, if you like, for, for SPS goods. IPAPS is a similar process, but the UK have done their own thing so because they need to own the database. So IPAPS starts on the 1st of Jan, um, but there is no requirement for an export health certificate at that point. So you purely a pre notification without an export health, without the requirement for an export health certificate issued in the EU to come into GB. So purely, purely a pre notification. From July, the export health certificate will be required uh, and there will be full SPS controls, which, which means there will be documentary checks and where necessary physical checks. So everything is physically checked, uh, but the, the option is there to physically check goods if uh, that's so required. So nothing's changed today, nothing changed at all. From January, the only change really is that there is a requirement for an IPAPS pre-notification and from July there is uh, quite a major change in that you also require the export health certificate from the EU. It should be noted as well that if you're using simplified processes at the frontier, because there is an IPAP de declaration required from January 22, then, th then that would require at least an SFD, a simplified frontier declaration, so that you could reference the IPAPS declaration on the entry. Okay. Safety and security declarations, which was the one where the, the EU actually offered the UK a waiver on this many years ago, and the UK said no, because how can we control our border if we're not controlling our border? So the safety and security declaration is still in the pipeline. It was due to start on the 1st of January, but that has been delayed until the 1st of July. So the only real change, excuse me, we're out of sip water. The only real change on the 1st of January is that the import declaration must be a frontier declaration of some description, um, which is going to be controlled by GBMS, which we'll come to in a minute. Uh, and there is a requirement for IPAS uh, pre-notification only or any products of animal origin uh, and any SPS goods. One that's kind of slipped under the radar a little bit is that there was talk of the a requirement for a GB EXS, which is an exit safety security declaration for 
empty transport units, that includes packaging, uh, containers, uh, and depending on how it works, the trailers, if there's an empty trailer going out. Um, at the moment, there is there is any excess, but it's it's embedded in the export declaration process, the EAD. So the excess has always been there, but it's embedded in the EAD. Of course, for empties, there is no EAD, therefore there's a requirement for an EXS only. And that was due to start on the 1st of October and is still due to start on the 1st of October. So nothing has changed there. Don't think that one's been kicked down the road just because the ENS, which is the entry summary declaration has been, the exit is still required on the 1st of October. We have a process in place for that already, but it's it's not it's actually it's not done through the normal kind of ENS process where you would use uh, a, a sort of different software package and go through something called ICS, which is the Import Control System. With EXS, you actually do a, a, an export declaration with a, a particular customs procedure code on it, and that then creates a, an EXS without a full export. Okay, but message us top right hand corner webinar at the Reader UK if you're not sure what to do or how to do it. Oh, slide one. There aren't too many slides, don't we? I'm going to focus here on Dover and Euratunnel because one is that's my natural, that's my comfort zone. I, I, I come from Dover. Um, I was very much involved with the ferries and freight and, and customs clearance at Dover. And equally, I, I uh, held a senior position at Euratunnel in the past. So that's my comfort zone anyway, but that's not why we're talking about it there. We're talking about uh, the changes at the frontier, uh, particularly to GBMS. And these changes are most uh, relevant to Dover and Eurotunnel because most of these locations don't um, are what's known as uh, non inventory linked. Therefore, they don't already have inventories running into them. Uh, and GVMS takes the role of the inventory. If you're already shipping into Perfleet or Tilbury or Killingham or Immingham, ports such as that, you might be familiar with, with inventory linking already and know what, how that process works. Uh, Dover and Eurotunnel haven't got the capacity really for inventory linking um, and GVMS does a, a, a sort of mirror version of that. Equally, I suppose everything I say for Dover and Eurotunnel is equally relevant for Hollyhead, by the way. I've not particularly said it here, but it but it is. So, it, so anything which is Calais Dover, Dunkirk Dover, for example, or, or Cockell Folkestone uh, is equally relevant for Dublin and Hollyhead. Good. So let's just paint the scene a little bit first of all. Because we're going to talk about those routes, let's look at what freight ferry stats look like year to date, August 21. And I think you might be quite surprised here. First of all, on the left hand side, and I'm just going to deliver all of these in one hit. Really. So, down the left hand side, the northern corridor for GB to the island of Ireland and GBNI, in this, specifically in this case, has seen a growth year to date compared to 2020 of plus 17%. Okay, the southern corridor is down 19%, which would maybe suggest that so there's been some traffic migration to go over the top into, into the island of Ireland. Uh, the Southern Corridor has seen a decrease of minus 32%. I mean, that it was, wasn't, they, there was the lowest set of numbers anyway, but the decrease is, is fairly obvious. They, they, also, they all have, having said that, Rosslare now has direct services to mainland Europe, thereby sort of cutting Brexit out by avoiding GB really. So, but nonetheless, the northern, northern route's grown, central corridor has suffered, um, but overall the market is only down minus 4%. Bear in mind here, we are comparing uh, year to date 21 with year, with year to date 20, and of course lockdown started in March 20. So we will, but, but, but I think that's still relevant because you're comparing pandemic with pandemic. Uh, and in actual fact, if you take the first sort of three months of 2020, there wasn't the pandemic. Uh, although if you took the first three months of the pandemic, the lockdown was the most severe. So it's, it's very hard to compare apples with apples in this scenario, uh, but, but we have to draw a line somewhere. Right hand side, I think will be the numbers that will surprise people, is that Dover is reporting year to date this year, minus 2% compared to last year, and Eurotunnel minus 3%. Those numbers maybe are nowhere near as high as you might have thought. I was talking to somebody yesterday, they were saying I was expecting to say 20%. But no, it's minus 2% compared to last year, year to date to August. Uh, Western Channel has suffered a little bit more, that's down minus 8%. Um, what we have seen though is in most areas, uh, the, there's been a growth in unaccompanied traffic. Now that may be partly due to driver shortage or partly due to uh, just a change of supply chain pattern, where if you know you've got to go to the frontier, uh, one of the ways of doing that without delaying the driver is remove the driver from the piece and just have, uh, just have trailers moving. 
Uh, hard to say yet, but there's not a lot of good data on that. Uh, it's going to blow my own trumpet for a minute, or our own trumpet for a minute, because the only growth in all of these areas is the Northern Corridor, GB to NI. The only frontier where we were involved in the design of the process, along with Fujitsu and IOE and the TSS team, was that one, was the one that's got the growth. So we actually designed all of the process flows into, uh, into from GB to NI, uh, with, the, with the remit all the time just to keep things moving, make sure freight keeps moving. And I have to say, these the, the processes that we're going to talk about that are going to be introduced on Calais Dover, for example, were live on day one on GBNI. So Frontier Declarations, GBMS, CFSP, everything that you can use to make life easier, uh, we were using on day one and have been since day one on GBNI flows. <coughs> Excuse me. Hence the reason why we're saying it works. Look at the figures. It shows that. Um, Hollyhead Dublin, for example, is full frontier declarations. There are, there are ETSS, they have now launched CFSP, which is the simplified process, but pretty much from day one it was full frontier declarations, um, and that's seen a reduction in traffic because logistics will naturally go for the path of least resistance, and the path of least resistance, um, because of the simplifications, is through the north. The proof of the pudding here, that's the only uh, freight route with growth um, since Brexit. Now, the only other one I wanted to cover, and this is my throwing a teddy bear in the middle of Britain here for a minute, is that you often read in the media the trade stats and says well, the trade with Germany's down, trade with Holland's down, da 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 da, the usual kind of thing. But we sit in the background and say, well, where the, where the heck are these numbers coming from? Because if, there, if people aren't doing declarations yet or are doing deferred declarations, these numbers can only really come from interest stat. And I've never been that confident in interest stat. The, the reason why we've shown the teddy bear is that sometimes trade has not changed at all, but the way it's reported has. So, for example, pre-Brexit, that teddy bear may have come from China on a container to Rotterdam, uh, customs cleared into free circulation in the EU, and then been distributed from a, a depot in Holland to customers all across the EU, some of which are in GB. Now, if that was the case last year, that would have been an intra-EU movement between Holland and GB. Would have been an interest stat declaration and would have shown up on the trade stats between the EU and GB, or in specifically Holland and GB. Not so after Brexit. After Brexit, if you if you kept the same process and you customs cleared that teddy bear in Holland and paid duty on that teddy bear in Holland, you would have to pay duty on it again in GB because it's still Chinese. Paying the duty doesn't change the origin. So what happens instead is that that teddy bear goes into bond in Rotterdam, it goes on transit to the UK and it's now an import from China. It's the same teddy bear, it's pretty much the same movement of freight, but what was in December last year an intra-EU movement in January is a Chinese export GB import from China. It's the same teddy bear. So just when you're reading trade stats, Think about the reporting mechanism, not just the numbers. Where are the numbers coming from and how are the numbers derived? It is almost impossible to compare apples with apples. Okay. Um, we're focusing on RORO for a couple of reasons, is that it's very, very different to maritime and air. I mean, that's it in a nutshell, really. The, even when we, when I was running the customs table at the Port of Dover and we, everything was going through Chief, which it still is, but there had to be amendments to the way, the functionality of Chief to cater for row road because it wasn't quick enough. So then we had to uh, handle transit in a slightly different way where the transit was shut down afterwards rather than beforehand. Uh, the typical way is you close the transit, get a reference and submit entries against that reference, too slow. So everything was turned on its back. So you're actually presenting entries and then closing the transit with the entries you presented. So things need to change for row road because row road has flexibility and speed. Maritime clearly doesn't. Air, air does, but air has a, a pretty rigid start point and end point, so you know when it's leaving and you know exactly when it's arriving, and it's not likely to divert airports. So you, you pretty much know from takeoff what's happening. With a truck, the moment he leaves your depot, he's going to try and get to the UK and he'll take his normal route, but sometimes he might jog around a little bit because of delays and where he would have gone through Dover, he's now going through Europe, he's now going through New Haven, he might go through Eurotunnel. Flexibility is key with road trucks. We did a lot of work with the Kent County Council on this actually, with uh, truck parking and Operation Stack, Operation Brock, uh, Dover Tap, and this, that, and the other, all these sort of ways of how you handle trucks. 
The one thing that I was always preaching at these meetings is if you delay a truck in its working time, you've got truck, trailer and driver. It's, it's a pound a minute. So if a driver is in his rest period, absolutely fine. That's why truck parks are a good thing because the driver's in his rest period and they can park under the truck park. No problem because they, it's not eating into their working time, if you like. If you eat into their working time, it is one pound a minute to delay a truck. So because of that, the processes for RORO need to be slick, simple, and as much as possible run in parallel to the movement of the goods and not particularly be a stop start process of I've loaded, I must now do customs. There's no reason why the customs and the, and the, the what we refer to as the physical movement of the goods should not really be affected by the fiscal movement of the goods, i.e. the customs declarations going on in the background. Okay, and that's where we base everything. We have a mantra in here, which is keep it simple, stupid, which is the KISS principle, first developed by the US Navy, I understand. Uh, I did a, a talk in Germany recently, and this was the one takeaway point. They love the keep it simple, stupid idea. Uh, we ran a full page ad, ad in the Times with this this week, which was quite provocative, but but it is keep it simple. To, don't look for complexity. And But that said, and hence the sort of image of Steve Jobs in the bottom left hand corner, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of knowledge to be able to simplify something. Now, personally, I've been in this business 40 years now. Um, I'm still learning, but there's an awful lot that I've obviously got in the bank from having so much uh, experience in the market. But it takes that kind of knowledge to be able to look at it. I'm, I'm quite fortunate in that I've run trucks, I've run distribution, I've run groupage, I've run ferries, and I've run a customs terminal. So yeah, I was pretty much training for Brexit in, before it happened for about 30 years. You know. So, but it, and that allows us to actually look at the pieces. Like in, in everything we do, we don't we don't particularly invent anything. We just line the pieces up in the right order that allows the simplification to be maximised. What does that look like? Well, my fear at the moment, and it is a genuine fear because I, look, I know this market very well. And this is what I'm seeing at the moment. So Brexit today for GB imports looks like that. It's super simple. You, the, there is an export invoice raised in Europe. There's an export declaration raised in Europe. You lodge that on SI Brexit in Calais, for example. You come into the UK and at some stage you lodge an import entry. And a lot of people who have done that and are now feeling quite confident, quite relaxed that they've got this Brexit thing licked. Um, this is what worries me. Now let's look at Brexit next year. There's a few more boxes on this one. And these, so suddenly now we've got the, uh, this isn't necessarily from January, but it's certainly 2022. We've now suddenly got the, the, maybe for SPS goods, there's a requirement for a health certificate, there's a requirement for an IPAS declaration, there's the import entry is still required, but now it's required at the frontier. There is a requirement to create the GB ENS, the, ex, the entry summary declaration, the safety security declaration. All of those MRNs and reference numbers need to be lost on GVMS, which is the mechanism that allows you to come to Britain. So where, you, where is the raise the export declaration and you put that on SI Brexit and that allows you in the Port of Calais. Technically you can't leave unless you have your ticket for GB, which is the GVMS. Doesn't exist today, does exist on the 1st of January. And that's the big one where people are looking at it and saying, well, GVMS is coming. We've been operating GVMS since day one on Northern Ireland flows. It works very well if you do it right. If you do it wrong, the truck sits there until you do it right. Okay, so you need to be really, really aware of this one. Uh, there may also be the requirement to go to a BCP. So we know there are more elements. This is the bit that worries me the most. You now have a groupage trailer with multiple agents and multiple MRNs because in the create GB import section, You've got a lot of people who say, I've got my own agent, I do it myself, I do this, I do that, we've solved the problem ourselves. And suddenly on a groupage, you've got a lot of people doing their own thing. That's okay today, but it's not okay when GVMS is in there. Because now the transport company who's got to do the GVMS, which is their kind of boarding pass, if you like, it's numbers for all of those import declarations. What if, now what if the agents stop working 24 hours? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if somebody's not done the entry yet? They can't do it until tomorrow. But it's going nowhere. That, that entry number, which today just happens after the event, must be lodged on GVMS before you can be allowed on the ferry in Calais. 
And then there's the difficulty where the trader might say, I do, I have my own agent, I, have my, I did the entry myself, or blah, blah, whichever way. There are many multiples of this. There is still ENS, the entry summary declaration, not till July, admittedly, but it's coming. Now, the ENS, by text or by law, if you like, is the responsibility of the prime carrier, the haulier, really, the transport company. I mean, officially, if you're shipping out a company, it's the ferry company, but the ferry companies don't really have the, they, they don't want to do it, and they don't really want, they don't really see why they should do it, so the prime carrier becomes the transport. So that, the ENS is stuck on the transporter here. Where's he going to get the data from? If somebody's doing all their own declarations and you say, well, can we help you with the declaration? No, you can't. We've got our own agent. We do our own thing. The transporter still needs data, not, not to the same granular level as a customs entry, but he needs data to be able to do the ENS. Otherwise, he's got gaps. So now we've got this situation with a groupage or, or, a, or a part load, really, more relevant in a part load, where the truck is winging its way towards Calais and it doesn't have all of the relevant reference numbers that it requires. Therefore, it can't complete the GVMS for the ones that are missing, which means you're not going anywhere. That's the GVMS process. That is your ticket to GB. And if you don't have the relevant declarations on the GVMS, you don't have a ticket for GB. This is the one that worries me. Remember, the original slide of this was just four or five boxes, man relaxing in a chair. Everything's good. I'm going to go into more detail on the GVMS, but just be very aware of it. It is it's a good process. It's worked very well in Northern Ireland, but it's it's got to be it's got to be accepted by the trade and you've got to change the processes to be able to work with it. Which leads me to the beware of false knowledge. It's not necessarily false knowledge, but we went when you've done this for 40 years, the only one of the reasons I got involved in, in initially consultancy and then agency is that I found myself shouting at the telly quite a lot with the bad advice that was coming out there. Then I found myself shouting at the market because there was quite a bit of bad advice coming out there. And then we had a situation where the, the market itself didn't have any knowledge at all in some cases, which was fine. That was a blank canvas. Went to a, to a situation which is a bit more dangerous, where there's a bit of knowledge, but when you don't know how much knowledge you need, you don't know what you don't know, really, then it's quite easy to think you've got everything that you need. It's not necessarily the case. These are the type of things that we came across quite a lot. Consultants in the market saying, you need AEO. Spend your time getting AEO. AEO is the most important thing you can do. It's not. I, I, I grew up in Dover. I know Dover well. There is not an AEO fast lane. Your time spent on AEO would have been much better getting CFSP approval because there is a process where you can get through, get through the frontier quicker than CFSP. I'm not saying AEO doesn't have its place. It doesn't have its place right now. It's not essential right now. CFSP may well be essential. Our argument is that it is essential. You need DTIs, binding tariff ruling. So if you're not sure whether the goods are this tariff or that tariff, this one carries 10%, this one carries 2%, you need to argue the fact that it's the 2% one, if it's relevant, obviously. When they're both zero, don't waste your time on BTIs. Spend your time on BOIs, binding origin uh, information, it's a really odd term. But by, if you're unsure of the origin, get the ruling on the origin because it's the origin that will qualify for the uh, for the preferential rate of duty. The commodity code, it, 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 if, you're, if you're arguing the goods are from Europe and the commodity code is in the duty free section, which most of them are, then you're not going to pay duty. But if there is some question of whether or not the goods are actually origin Europe or origin Japan, Vietnam, or something, then it's the origin you need to focus on, not the commodity code. The other one a lot is, FFDs, we use this term a lot, full frontier declarations. They're the way, that's what we need to do. Everybody needs to do FFDs. Let's have a look at that one in a bit in detail. We come across this a, a lot, okay? We're doing full frontier declarations. This is the, a trader speaking. We're doing full frontier decks because that's what we've always done for maritime and air. That's what we know best. So Brexit's just more of that. It isn't that. You can't, you are not today I'm thinking about Dover and Europe here. This is a pretty bold statement. Today, you are not doing full frontier declarations. I'll tell you why, because there isn't a frontier. So what you're doing at the moment is a full declaration. Let me explain. The current process, present day, looks like this. The truck loads in Europe. There is an declaration. That export declaration MRN number, 
is loaded on is logged on SI Brexit or equivalent, so that you're allowed into port, so that and that controls the closure of the export and therefore releases the back liability to the sender. Then pass the information, or at some stage in that process, you pass the information to the import agent in the UK, whether that you're, whether you're doing the declarations yourself or you're using a customs broker. And that customs broker is going to do a full frontier declaration. We're all lovingly calling an FFD as a full frontier deck. And the truck is free to move itself to GB. And everything's going wonderfully well. So the full frontier deck must be working because the supply chain hasn't been particularly affected on GB or EU GB, aside from the obvious. Yeah, I mean, Brexit affected, there's still COVID, there's still driver shortages, and everything else when I'm talking about the actual customs flows. So, so FFD must be working because it's working. So the reason why it's working at the moment is because it doesn't matter. So the frontier declarations being done in the background is not affecting the movement of the goods. So the frontier declaration should be pre-lodged before you arrive in Calais, but nobody knows where the truck is at this point. There's barely any control. There, there are obviously exceptions to this, but I'm being quite general. And, and to be fair, in most cases when we find this, we find that it's, it is this situation, is that the truck has been loaded and therefore there's a requirement for an import declaration, but nobody really knows which port the truck even came in or even whether it's here. This really matters next year. So at the moment, the full frontier declaration must be pre-lodged, although it kind of doesn't matter if it isn't. And then it must be arrived, meaning that the goods have arrived in the UK by midnight of the second day. And in a lot of cases, nobody even knows if the goods have arrived because nobody knew where the truck was because there is no frontier. Unload the goods in between. So full frontiers decks, I, look, I get it. If you look at this from the outside, full frontier decks are working perfectly because that's what I'm doing and everything's coming and being delivered exactly as it was because there is no frontier. Frontier in there. Now suddenly that frontier declaration is not something which is kind of at your leisure in inverted commas. Now you've got to do it and get the MRN number for it, or the entry of MRN in CDS, entry number in Chile. So you've got to get the entry number for it, let's say, and lodge that in Calais. I mean, I've been a bit generous here, a bit of poetic license here, saying you can't arrive in Dover. You can't leave Calais unless the GVMS is up to date. And that GVMS must have the entry number of the, de of the full frontier declaration. So where before you had quite a bit of time, I mean, in some cases, people use it three or four days, some people do it much tighter than that, but suddenly there's a much tighter, tighter push. So if something loads in Lille, it goes to Calais, it loads in Lille today at midday, it's in Calais at 4 p.m. and it ships across tonight, but you don't do the declaration till tomorrow, not a problem. From the 1st of January, if you don't do the declaration till tomorrow, the truck's still in Calais waiting for you to do the declaration. Now, the, the worry for that is it's not making use of simplifications. More importantly, I think, is it's actually stressing the capacity that's available within the intermediary market simply because not to restart, simply because you're trying to do too much in a tight time frame and that's just going to for, that's going to put pressure on the capacity that's in the market simply what simplifications allow you to do is to pull the peaks down to have a much more level workflow okay so frontier is a problem here if you are doing full frontier decks now add the word frontier in there and suddenly you realize it maybe your solution is not quite as good as, it, as you thought it was as I've said, that has to be lodged at the port before you can come. The entry is arrived by GVMS. There is no longer a process where you go in and arrive the entry. The GVMS is the arrival mechanism. There could then be uh, failures. I don't think that will stop the vehicle, to be fair, is that the arrival mechanism is normally uh, entries on GVMS. GVMS uh, creates a GMR record. There'd be one GMR number for that truck. Underneath that sits all the entries that belong to that truck. They check in with the GMR number. The GMR number is now associated to the truck, the check-in and the ferry. When the ferry sails, it reaches the point of no return, a couple of miles out, and GVMS has to arrive with the declarations because the, the vessel has reached the point of no return. It's, it's in the UK all, all bar arriving yet. And that will then start to risk assess those entries. And if there's any uh, failure on deferment accounts, they'll fail. But, but I don't think you're not, you're not going to get stopped on the 1st of January because there's a, an insufficient funds on a deferment account for something that's hard for across the channel. It, it may well happen from July onwards, but I don't see it happening initially on GVMS. 
Uh, and then you're, now you're threatening the delivery of the goods because you first of all got to negotiate the frontier, then you've got to actually get the customs clearance done and finished before you can deliver the goods really in the right way. So you're stressing this area from a process that honestly, nine out of 10 people which we speak to today say, oh, we use full frontier decks. And I'm, I've hardly got any hair left for pulling it out because the walking into this situation where it, it won't work very well, it can still work, but the stress you're putting on everybody, and bear in mind that part load scenario as well, where suddenly I need all these declarations. If you stick with the simplifications, which is what we've done from day one, I mean, you can count on one hand the frontier declarations that we've done since day one. We literally only do them for controlled goods, for fish, for example, where we, and even then we do a simplified frontier deck. Remember here, I'm talking about Dover and Eurotunnel. We, we work very closely with an operator who uses full frontier declarations for containers into GB, and that works perfectly well for their scenario because it's inventory linked, and they've also got very good data management. So there, it, it is the right solution. We only use simplifications. If there is a showstopper on one of the entries, we flip it to simplifications so to come tomorrow. Why well, I'm saying with Dover Calais or Eurotunnel or Dunkirk, or Dunkirk, sorry, it's the right way, Calais Dover, Dunkirk Dover, or Eurotunnel, is make sure you've got that flexibility in there. Use the simplifications as much as you can. It's what we've done since day one. So there is still entry and declarance records, which is the CFSP approval. We've used that. We use it in Northern Ireland. We've used it since day one. I'm not seeing anybody complaining about delays at the at port. When the, the whole objective of, of the process we designed in Northern Ireland was that there should be no delays at Cairn Ryan, for example. Uh, and believe me, the press were there on day one waiting to photograph all the trucks delayed and there weren't any. So the, the whole sort of concept was there's nothing to see here because everything was using the maximum simplification. And, and this is, to be fair, what, what we thought and what HMRC thought would happen to, to GB imports. And we we're both sitting there saying, I don't understand why everybody's doing frontier declarations when there is a, a simple tool over here that makes life easier. It's a, whether you use sandpaper or an electric sander, why would you, if you can afford the electric sander and it's available, why don't you use the electric sander? It's a lot easier. Not unless you're an absolute craftsman. The simplifications are there for a reason, okay? Talk to, rather than say, do I need to use them? Turn that around on its head and say, convince me that I don't need them, rather than convince me that I do, because they're there for a reason. They've worked in Northern Ireland perfectly. So under the simplifications, even next year, even with the deferred entry scheme gone and all this type of thing, there is still the, the you can still use simplifications at the frontier, which is entry and declaration records or simplified frontier deck. That means you've got a very, very simple process on GBMS. You can go and deliver the goods exactly as you do today, and you've got until the fourth working day of the following month to finish the process. So for me, I'm not at all worried about the 1st of January, but I'm quite worried about the 1st of February, in that during January, we would have had a lot of consignments going through, which are on our entry and records approval, and I need that data by the fourth work, I need to have submitted that declaration by the fourth working day of February. So we're working very closely with our customers at the moment to compress the data flows so that at the moment where it might take a month to get the data, it needs to be, it needs to be a week, and towards the end of the month, it needs to be days. The processes are there, the simplifications are there. We, and I say we are recording all of this, so it is, you know, we will share the link later on. Um, and we're back to the keep it simple, stupid process. We're not accusing you of being stupid, we're accusing that wavy line of being stupid. So keep it simple, cut through all the noise as much as possible. At the moment there is, and we get a lot of this, is we, we still say, you got to you know, stop using frontier decks, I don't understand why you're doing it. And the trader will rightly say, but I don't want to delay the entry. It's too, it's too difficult for me to manage. I want to get the entry done. Normally from the procurement or the treasury or the finance department of the trader. You get that, they can make that request or demand all day long because it has no implication on the supply chain because there is no frontier. From January, the GBMS, suddenly finance is saying, I don't want to delay the entry. Delay my truck. Because suddenly there's an implication of the truck which doesn't exist today does exist in January. I think I bet that point a thousand times. The one that always amazes us is when people say, well, I, I, don't, I can't use entry, I don't want to delay the entry and I can't use entry and declarations records. And you go, okay, let's do this another way. 
How do you know the products are cleared when you, you go to your warehouse and you get stuff back from France? How do you know it's cleared? Actually, invariably, the answer is because it's here. In the, and I get that. People are saying, well, look, if it wasn't cleared, it couldn't have got here. But it can. I can show you a thousand ways where I can get the stuff to you without clearing it. The other one is we use full frontier declarations to exactly avoid the problem is it must be cleared before it got here. Again, you don't know. Those that are sensible have also subscribed to MSS data, which is a, a subscription service from the MRC. I think it's about £300 a year or something per Yori number. And that will give you a, 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 for example, a monthly report of any import declarations where your Yori number is shown as the trader. So I've got quite a few traders that will say to me, well, no, we do full frontier declarations. We make sure everything's cleared. So well, how do you make sure everything's clear? They said, because they have also have multiple agents doing this. They said, well, we check with MSS data, so we know what declarations have been done, and we check that with the records of the goods that we've received, and we check that we've got everything we've received has had a declaration done. I said, that's nice. You're actually doing entry and declarations records, just you're doing it back to front. So the, on, on entry and declarations records, you start with the record and you do the declarations. Here you're starting with the declarations and comparing it to your records. It doesn't matter. You're doing the same thing. You are working entry and declarations records. So rather than somebody saying, how do you know the goods are cleared? Because I can see them, they're outside. Let's turn that on its head. How do you know they're outside? Because you don't go and walk around the warehouse and look for everything. Because they're in your inventory. Because you have your records to say that you've ordered something and it's been received and I have a proof of delivery and therefore I have paid, or I have a goods input and therefore I have paid the supplier. You have a record. It's that record which is the border. That's the frontier. That is the trigger that then requires a supplementary declaration. Don't need to be involved in the frontier declaration that's going to stress the truck. At the moment, you've also got the luxury of up to 175 days. You don't have to take 175 days. It's not a ruling. You have up to. And we've got a lot of people saying to us, oh, I can't take that long. Well, don't take that long. Do it tomorrow. But And to be fair, a next day sub deck, we do quite a few of those, is exactly the same as what you might be referring to as a full frontier deck. It's basically a declaration. And without the frontier, you're doing the same declaration I'm doing. Just I'm calling it entry and declaration records and you're calling it FFD. It's the same thing. But now when you put the frontier in there, needs to be some some form of simplification in my mind. So we had the deferred entry, which is basically a, a kind of bastardization of CFSP entry and declarations records. It's a kind of relaxation of the of the entry uh, timelines. Um, and again, people say because they saw TSP before and they're saying, well, we don't want this kind of cobbled solution. We're familiar with frontier declarations and we're going to use frontier declarations. We don't want to use this new fangled CFSP thing. Prior to Brexit, 75% of the declarations, seven, well, 70 to 75% of the declarations done in chief for GB imports were done on CFSP. 75% were done on CFSP for rest of world imports into GB. Largely, I, I take it that some of that was through because of where the CFSP was used for warehouse clearances, but 75% of the of the debt of the transactions that required an import declaration were done on simplifications. Yet the thing that's blowing all of our minds is that the UK traders looked at Europe and said, don't want to use that. Let's use this frontier declaration. CFSP as is 1998. It was invented in 1998. It hasn't been cobbled together for the last minute. Honestly, look at your operation. Start with the premise that you're going to have CFSP and then see, argue the point of why you don't need it rather than why you do need it. But start with the fact that you, that you need it. And then try and convince yourself that you don't, not the other way around. Then have some quite a few of our clients who who are using entry and declaration records, as you uh, as you'd imagine, because that's the kind of process we're doing, the simplified process. So we're already doing entry and declaration records. In a lot of cases, no, you're not. I'm being quite general. But for true entry and declaration records, the record keeper and the and the approved person is the same person. What we've got at the moment is the record keeper, the trader is using the approval of the intermediary to do the declaration. So they're not actually the same thing. That can still go forward next year. For, for example, our approvals for entry and declaration records and SDPs or simplified declaration processes, they, they, we can offer those to the market, um, but equally we handle uh, CFSP declarations for traders today 
to get them CFSP uh, approval in their own right, and we do that free of charge. There is a contract you have to sign in this thing agreement. There's a contract you have to sign that says you will use us to do the declarations, the supplementary declarations, but we'll do all of the application process free. So if you if you decide that you want to look at CFSP, but you you're confused by the process, it's free of charge for us. I think I've rammed home the frontier point. My point is there is a frontier coming, and if you sit there and think that the existing process where there isn't a frontier will work, think again. Really re-examine. Brexit hasn't started yet. This was just a warm-up. Let's talk about iPads. That wasn't a horse sound. That was just me getting a bit of breath. Let me get a quick sip of water. So let's talk about iPads for a minute. Big fig, uh, sorry, big fear of this one was it was going to start next week. Pretty much the point was next week. Uh, it's not there. It's first of January. But let's look at what the process was because we were ready. So let's look ready for because this is what's going to happen. It's just this process has been delayed slightly. So I'm going to show you what the full blown, blown process is and then which bits have been delayed. So I don't, it's not as, look, with all of these things, it's like the offside rule. But if you know what the rule is, you won't agree with it, but if you know what the rule is, you can play to it. So what we have with iPads. Step one, trader is responsible for the import standards of the goods. Just because you're doing an iPad, just because somebody's doing the iPad for you, it is, the, it is the importer who's responsible for the standards of the goods that they've ordered to come into GB. PRFTL, we have acronyms in this business, is the party responsible for the load. Uh, must be registered on iPads. It's the same on traces. We have to be uh, party responsible and we actually uh, present. What that actually means is I'm not responsible for the, the, the food standards. I'm responsible for that process coming through the frontier. So if uh, Border Force wants to talk to somebody, if DEFRA or DERA or whatever wants to talk to somebody about that declaration, they they, attack, they speak to the person who's responsible for the load. And hence the reason we do the declarations, we get the call at two o'clock in the morning when there's a problem. Equally, if there's any charges, we pay those charges. So the party responsible for the load is, is a bit like your customs broker who's also responsible for the process at the frontier. And don't forget there is a frontier coming. So, Trader is responsible. Party for uh, uh, the party responsible for the load must be registered on iPads, and, um, and not yet, but will probably also require an account. The export arranges the export health certificate. It's inspected by the official vet. It's sealed at pallet level if need be, and this is they test their trialing seals or have been trialing seals quite successfully. This some they weren't pretty, they weren't so good, but the idea is. So this is only for uh, part loads or groupage. If it's a full load, you don't need this pallet level seal, but I've gone to the worst possible scenario. So in a part load, you've got the pallet level seal, which is, so the seal is nylon banded. Sorry, the pallet is nylon banded and sealed and that's recorded and now the vehicle can move on because otherwise you've got multiple seals and multiple seal breaks, which makes the declarations all inconsistent. Uh, it's sealed at pallet level and the seal number is shown on the export health certificate. The haulier applies the commercial seal at the final pickup, uh, and the OV can also sign that off if they're there as well. But it's not necessarily essential if all pallets have got separate seals. The declaration is done as normal. The iPass declaration is created. It doesn't have to be done in, in advance unless, unless you've got more acronyms. HRFNAO, I practiced that one in my HRFNAO, high risk foods, not of animal origin. So if, if you're carrying high risk foods not of animal origin, the IPAS declaration or pre-notification has to be done first. That creates a UNN number and that UNN number has to be passed to the exporter because it has to be stated on the export health certificate. HRFNAO is not the most prevalent form of uh, SPS goods coming to UK. So in most cases it's perhaps animal origin, for example, cheese, yogurts, then those goods, uh, the, the IPAS notification can be done. Um, after the vehicle's left, but before it's arrived. There was also talk of that being 24 hours before it arrived. That's four hours. It, it's 24 hours in traces, but it's four hours in reality. So DEFRA were already saying, or customers are already saying, that's a four hour window, not a 24 hour window. Uh, number 10, we've always said entering documents records on arrival, although it might be a simplified frontier deck, actually, more, um, because it's controlled goods. Actually, difference here, there are controlled goods, diamonds, nuclear isotopes, what have you, and there are goods with control, which means there are, for example, an IPAS declaration. So you can still use entry and declarations records, but it's uh, it's going to need an SFD at frontier. The GB authority completes the paperwork check. 
The physical check may be required, but not necessarily on everything, and the goods are then free to deliver. That's the worst case scenario of groupage on a trailer with health certs and IMAPs. Now, I recognise I'm super simplifying the fact that number three say export your ranges, export health cert. That's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's also something that we can't do and you can't do unless you're on this call as an exporter from the EU. It's just something that has to be done. The good news is it doesn't have to be done from July next year. That's the full blown worst case scenario process. Now let's look at what's delayed. The bits that are greyed out are not are not required from January. So you don't need the, you don't need the health certificate. We would we're recommending that you keep the seal process going. Start to, don't use this period as a as a stay of execution, really. It's so, well, I'm not gonna, I don't have to do anything now. You do practice, 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 practice. Do the bits that you can do. So if you, if you can't, or if you're not required to do the X Y certificate, don't do it. But if you if you know you're going to end up with a seal, start to get used to doing seals. Start to get used to sealing pallets. Just start the process so that it's not a big shock when it comes. The good news is it has been, it's a much softer start. It's certainly not October, and even from January, it's purely a declaration rather than uh, supporting documentation or physical checks. So, bottom right hand corner, we have a cow, the same cow, only now he's a bit happier than he was before. I'll go ahead, that on a slide, and I'll be desperate to keep that smiley face. As I said, we were ready. We already put a, a web process in the background where we had sort of uh, data capture because the data capture was. We looked at all sort of ways of capturing the data, but the hardest thing for us was the species or the category and the family, and it all depends on the product. So the vet, there were so many variables that we decided probably the only way we could to get the species and category and family right was to actually see the export health certificate. So we've got a bit of a challenge now in that, in that because there is no export health certificate, but there is still an IPAS, I've got a challenge with the data now because the type of data we required would have already been on the export health certificate, only now there isn't one. But the team's working on it, and we're going to try and get work well. We'll come up with a plan as we always do. Right, so let's go a bit techy. We talked about trucks and movement of goods. Let's just actually get into now the other changes that are coming. Um, the first one is proof of origin, because that's pretty loose at the moment. See the importer's knowledge everywhere, and the importer doesn't have any idea that we're putting importer's knowledge, or any agent's putting importer's knowledge, and half the time the importer doesn't have the knowledge. That's kind of okay at the moment. It's not right, but it's not wrong. Okay, New next year. So the trade cooperation agreement for GB imports says if the goods are at EU origin, except for a few cases, they're pretty much, there's no duty. Uh, you require a statement of origin by the exporter, which should look like the grey box there, but very few invoices have that on them. Start to talk to your suppliers in Europe, get that declaration on the invoice because it should be on the invoice. We, we're very lucky at the moment if we see one that has the origin on it. I saw one the other day that was quite clever that said origin France uh, and then another one from another supplier that said manufactured in France. That's well, not the same thing. So there was two different products. So, so the one who was saying origin France, nice and clear, no statement, just that was it, origin France. But the one that says manufactured in France, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't, that's not the origin, that's just where it was assembled. It doesn't necessarily mean that the origin is French. So and in actual fact, it rings alarm bells because you're actually thinking, why are you using that word? You're using that word because the origin isn't France. Is you know, I mean, if I was a customs officer, that's what I'd be thinking. So you must have the origin statement. Importer's knowledge is based on the evidence obtained, i.e., that kind of statement, and the and the well, I would say that statement's only on every invoice. The origin obtained by the importer has got to be that, that they are satisfied that the origin declared is the correct origin. Currently, you don't require that evidence in advance. You just you can claim importer's knowledge. And then you must use best endeavours to get that evidence retrospectively. First of January, you must have that evidence in your file. We can't say importer's knowledge unless you have knowledge. Okay, so we've got again a couple of web pages. We do like a web page uh, when we can. So we've got one uh, for origin, but also underneath that is a section for proof of origin. So we've got uh, we've got a web page and we've got a free service here uh, where we will, if you've got any origin issues, speak to our consultants who, who will handle it free of charge. And help you go, help you uh, uh, with the guidance and, and actually ascertain what the origin is. And then the second part of that process is now what proof do I need of that origin? Okay. It's free, it's there, use it. Return goods relief, we get this one a lot. I think this is particularly relevant in Ireland because you might have goods coming from Poland, for example, they're stored in GB for retail distribution, uh, and, and some of them end up in a, in a supermarket in Dublin. 
uh, but they're all stored in GB. They were suddenly they were coming to they came into GB. They were customs cleared in GB uh, because they're Polish. They're Polish origins, duty free. It might be food. There's no duty. There's no VAT. We might as well clear it. It's cleared. Ta da! Now it's going to go to Ireland, and now it's not GB origin. It's EU origin going to the EU, and therefore it doesn't qualify for duty free relief under the Trade Cooperation Agreement. But it does under return goods relief if the goods have not been uh, altered in any way. So if you can, but in order to do that, you must code the entry a particular way, obviously, because that's what entries are for. Um, and you must have the original export MRN number for the original movement from, in this case, Poland to GB. If you have that, you don't need this INF3 document as well. You only need it instead. So if you can't get the export MRN, you can use an information document, but it's quite cumbersome that one. Better to get the MRN for the original movement from EU into GB so that you can prove that these goods unaltered are going to uh, back to the EU. We did have one the other day when we had a product coming in from Holland, clearly Dutch origin, coming into GB and being processed in GB and then re-exported to France. The problem was when we looked at it, they don't qualify for return goods relief because they've been altered. However, they weren't altered sufficiently to change the origin. So this double duty scenario here could work on uh, outward processing relief so that the exporter is sending the goods out under duty suspension well, on, on a process saying they are coming back. But the problem is that exposes the Dutch guy to the French guy and they didn't want that to happen. So, but, but we found a solution. In some ways we changed the process on some of the goods. So talk to us. This is a complex area and at the moment it's just a big fat broad brush of importers knowledge. You need to, if you need to get more specific and I would argue that you do, then speak to our experts on it because they will offer you free advice. Duty and VAT is the other one that catches people out. Direct transport rules. This really catches people out. GS, let's take GSP for example, products from Myanmar, formerly Burma. And to be fair, I, Myanmar became quite a thing. Myanmar's on a real growth because everything I pick up at the moment seems to be made in Myanmar, including I think even the t-shirts I'm wearing. So Myanmar's part of the GSP, the general system of preferences, and the EU has a zero rate of duty under the GSP scheme. Perfect. So if the goods come from Myanmar to the EU, duty free. From Myanmar to GB, Duty free under GSP, providing they have Form A or evidence of origin. Lovely. So both of them have free trade deal with GSP. However, there is a direct transport rule. If you bring the goods into the EU and customs clear them into free circulation in the EU, they've lost their GSP status. And now they are Myanmar goods arriving in GB without any preference. Now, in the, the scenario we looked at was rice, actually. Because rice is heavy and the duty is based on the weight, rice is heavy and relatively low value, it ends up being an 80% duty rate. And here, the UK does not have an agreement in place with the EU to allow traders to use as replacement proof of origin to distribute GSP goods between the EU and the UK. This is the direct transport rule you need to be aware of. Inward outward processing relief. The other one is there's all this double duty jeopardy. I'm proper techie here. Um, our eyeball, that's what Matt always says to me, that looks like an eyeball and he's right, it does look like, quite like an eyeball, is that it's often a four-legged stool. So if you've got goods leaving uh, one customs territory to go to the other one, to end up back in the other one, in the, in the, in the one it started in, then you've actually got this three-legged, three, sorry, four-legged stool. So you've got an initial outward processing relief movement because you know the goods are coming back. And the only reason you're doing an OPR at that stage, so perhaps an outward processing movement, is so that you can get the duty when it comes back. It doesn't actually affect the original out, but it absolutely affects step four, which is the return of the goods that left temporarily. So you can't, you've got to initially send the goods temporarily in order to claim the relief of the return of the goods which temporarily left. Follow me? So the four-legged stool is OPR out, Inward processing relief in, and the goods are coming in, but they're duty free because I'm only going to process them in the training courses. We've always done it, so we always used the example was always used as a transistor radio, where it's coming in as a radio. We're adding the aerial or the antenna, and then we're shipping it back again because we're really good at adding antennas. That could be a common sort of scenario. So I OPR out, inward processing relief in, so there's duty suspension. The re export of the goods which temporarily came in for processing. 
can the re-importation of goods which temporarily left that customs territory to be processed outside of that customs territory? It's the formula installed. It is most commonly the formula installed. At number three here, or number two and three, if you bring the goods in under duty suspension because you're going to process them, and then you can't account for all of the goods leaving, then you have to pay the duty on the goods that you can't account for because de facto they never left. Because you can't complain that they left. So if they come in, you process them and they leave, there's duties in full suspension. If they come in, you might even sell some in the UK. You then pro you then sell those that you then import and you then do the import entry for that for those goods because they stayed in that customs territory. The message being the goods don't pay, you don't pay duty on the goods until they reach their final destination. Quick sip, because now just when you thought it couldn't get any more techie, we'll talk. Only because I don't think people have grasped this yet. Postpone VAT accounting. You don't have to apply for it, you're automatically registered for it if you've got a GB VAT number. Nothing to do with you are registered. We just have to code the entry to say that you want to use postpone VAT accounting. And if we code the entry correctly, you've got to pay cash VAT at the frontier. If you don't have a UK VAT number, you can't have postpone VAT accounting. What that then happens though, is we quite often get a situation where after the event, so we gave you the wrong invoice price, the VAT should have been this, or then we gave you, you overpaid the VAT, and it, it all comes out through the VAT return because the process of postponing VAT accounting is an, is an input tax adjustment. So let's just go over the basics of how VAT works. It's not as complicated as it looks. Any VAT you pay is classed as an input. Simply, you buy something, you pay VAT, that goes in your records as an input. Anything you sell, plus that, because you're VAT registered, counts as an output. So let's say you buy a whole bunch of stuff with VAT, and you sell, you make a bit of profit, and you sell all the goods, plus that. There is a difference between the VAT you paid and the VAT you collected as part of your sale price. The bit that you then have to pay to the tax man. So you pay the difference between the input and the output. Okay? In some cases, the input will be higher than the output, in which case you will recover the VAT from the tax bill. Where you have postponed that accounting on your import declarations, you haven't yet paid the VAT because nobody asked you for it. So you haven't paid it, and therefore the process on your VAT return is a simultaneous or instantaneous or simultaneous section payment and reclaim. So you, you account for the VAT and simultaneously pay it and reclaim it. So it kind of has no other impact on your VAT return other than you put that amount in and you've immediately reclaimed it. So you didn't pay it, you claim it. <coughs> because of that, if there is any, if there's, customs will very, very rarely, I mean, can't think of any really, where they make a VAT only adjustment to a post clearance amendment to an entry for a VAT registered trader, because they've got better things to do with their time, because it clears it up through the VAT return in any case. So it's just when you have a when you're using a customs agent and you might say you've overpaid the VAT and the customs agent says okay sorry won't happen again but I can't, but you need to fix it through the VAT return he's not being awkward that's the process okay and that catches people now is where you're using multiple agents to do multiple things and somebody codes the entry wrong and then some of it you do pay so it's you've not gone on to spend that accounting and you actually pay VAT. Uh, at the point of importation. So that might be a groupage operator, for example, who's paid it and then demands the VAT off you. It's fine, you can still get the VAT back, you've got to do it a different way. So because of that, you might have paid deferment charges. Uh, you've now got, you now get, uh, with the postponed VAT accounting, you don't get a VAT certificate, a C79, the green document. Um, I think it's green still. Um, you don't get that, but you just get an online VAT statement of the like of all the things that have gone on postponed VAT accounting. If the VAT has been paid, you will get a VAT statement arrive in the post. Um, don't be surprised if you get some of those, but if you have got one of those, then chances are somebody somewhere has paid the VAT. We we get them every now and then, and I'm not a trader. We're not an importer. Uh, we've worked out it's a fast parcel operator who keeps thinking our ERA number is the importer's ERA number. And whilst you might have paid the VAT and got the money from the trader, I've got the VAT cert, so we have to try and fix that in the background. So, Postpone VAT accounting, no C79, no green certificate because you haven't paid anything. You just claim it through the online statement. If you get a C79, somebody's paid VAT, okay, or used your or used your EORI number incorrectly, 
which you would have seen had you been subscribing to MSS data. Right at the beginning, if you subscribe to MSS data, you get a monthly report of everywhere but your URI number is flushed up on the HMRC system. The resounding message again. Oh, sorry, no, if you have, sorry, I missed this box. If you have, if it has been paid, whereas the postponed method accounting was a simultaneous payment and reclaim, if it has been paid and you've got a C79, somebody's parted with the money, in which case you can include it in your input tax deduction, thereby reducing, if your output was higher than your input, reducing the amount you have to pay to customers. Okay, so if you if you paid it, you absolutely have to reclaim it, but if you postponed it, then it's a, it's a payment and reclaim at the same time. The easiest way to do it is have less agents, one agent if you can, and use everything on the team because we're back to our old rules. Stupid. Make it as easy as you can. Don't make life hard for yourself. Our number one advice in Brexit when it was when it was first coming up was don't go looking for borders. But I suppose now we, we've moved on from that. And now we're kind of saying don't go looking for trouble because there's trouble there if you want to go and find it just by process you know but also at the moment you've got you, you might have uh, procurement and finance working in a certain way and it has no real spin-off or back spin to the to supply chain that's going to change and therefore you're going to make sure that you cater for all elements of that otherwise at the moment what you might find is there is some delay to the truck which wasn't there in december and is there in january right what do, what do we do differently i mean this isn't what about sales pitch but i just want to show about how we do things slightly differently because i've done this for 40 years and taken a bit of a gap in the middle um because there wasn't enough business really i just didn't really want to do the customs clearance uh, you know for maritime and air that's not really my bag but when brexit came along you know, the critical mass has kind of driven innovation at our end but has also allowed us to look at it with a pretty fresh start I'm going to say slightly differently, but that's that's almost to say that other agents don't do this. I'm not saying other agents don't do this at all. I'm just saying this is what we do. So we always start. We're very, very, very conscious about data. All we're worried about is data, really. Try to sort of not mention customs clearance, mention customs declaration. We're worried about data because we need data and how and and we need it from you in most cases. So how can we make the process smoother? So whenever we onboard a client, they go into an initial white glove service. Um, so they've got maximum care, kind of hyper care, if you like. Um, let's not say that we then release them from that, but we only release them from that once everything's settled that we've, we've reached BAU, business as usual. So in that period, we concentrate on getting all of the coding right in the background, streamlining the data flow so that so that customs isn't a step in process. Like within the within the movement of goods from A to B, customs is step five, let's say. But we don't want it to be step five. We want it to be a consequence of step one to four. Otherwise, you're stepping in and you've got something to do. We don't want you to have to do that. Once we're all comfortable that everyone's working well, we, we slip it into account management rather than the hypercare. So we can take the hypercare elsewhere. We also track meticulously the SLA. So we have published a uh, service level agreement of two hours to return documents around. Not saying January, that was 72 hours because January was longer. But, but now we have a complete SLA tracker. So we agree SLAs with the client, but our published SLA is two hours. We're, we're fully 24 hours, we're fully independent because we operate trucks. We've got uh, 130 members of the team now, which uh, has grown massively this year, and we're still growing. Uh, even though we use a lot of robotics, we still have a lot of people. Um, and we, the robots for us is not so much about uh, trying to get more declarations through, really. It's just to, to do a customs entry can be pretty mind-numbingly boring for about 75% of the customer declaration. It's the 25% where the skills involved, which is the interesting bit. So we use the robots to do the mind-numbingly boring bit, because otherwise, ironically, if you've got if you've got the kind of brain that can learn customs entries in, in a short space of time, you've got the kind of brain that will go absolutely nuts doing customs entries within six months, because quite a lot of it is copy typing. So we make sure that, that we keep it fresh by using robots. Um, so our SLA is tracked. That's a, a sort of screen you can see there as a graphic of it. It's actually the real thing. It does really look like that. Uh, and it's on a massive screen in our operations office, so everybody can see it all of the time. Um, it, it just keeps us fresh. And it also means that if, if I walk into the office, for example, and say, well, look, how are things going? Guess what? They'll all say, yeah, fine, it couldn't be better. It's all going wonderfully well. Thank you very much for asking. Now there's a massive screen in the office that I can actually see what's going on straight away. And if something's turned red, I can see it. 
If there's a complete breach of the SLA, we, we uh, the senior management will get a, uh, a text message. So we don't want that. So, and everything's recorded. It all goes into a ticketing system. The SLA is tracked. And if it goes over the two hour window, it, the color starts to change from green towards red if it's gone over the two hours. Um, the one that's thrown out at the moment is inventory linking. So the job comes in, but we're waiting for the inventory to be created. So well, often I walk downstairs and the screen put it red and I'm hopping around everywhere. And, the, and then they're explaining to me that it's inventory linking and we're waiting for the manifest items to appear. But fine, we've changed it, we're doing that now. But on the whole, everything comes in. The, the, the ticketing system controls what the client can see uh, and it also controls the SLA against that client. Uh, and as I say, if it goes over, over the line, we all get a text message and we don't really need to get those. Um, we're also very conscious about future proofing. Is that like it's all, this is why we're talking about next year already? But I mean, okay, well, let's talk beyond that. Chief, Chief, which is the custom town and municipal expert freight, has got a best before date, and it's next year. And I know we've all heard that before, but believe me, it's next year. There are, there are ways that we know that, but it is next year. So Chief is going, and CDS is coming in, which is the customs declaration service. And um, we, we're, we're very familiar with Chief because it's we use a very similar process in Ireland. It was AIS, which went live in November before before Brexit. And I have to say, Revit, you did a fantastic job with that because having seen what happened with Chief and CDS so many times, I looked at AIS going live in November and thought, it's not going to work. It did. I mean, it had its problems later on, but not initially. Bearing in mind in Ireland, there were more declarations done in January than in January 21 than there were in the whole of 2020. Okay, so the multiplier in Ireland did 20. Uh, even with the traffic being down, there were more declarations in January than the whole previous year, and, and it survived really well. So we're very familiar with CDS uh, technology and terminology in Ireland and also in XI, Northern Ireland, because uh, Northern Ireland's been in CDS from day one. And in fact, Chief is holding us back a little bit at the moment because we've got a bunch of people in the organisation that know you can pretty much solve everything with Link 99 as a code, as you kind of get out a jail card, and we don't want them doing that. You can't do that on CDS. So we get, um, so we end up with otherwise two layers of, uh, of agent, ones that can just use Link 99 all over the place to get out of jail, and the ones who actually use the correct coding that's going to be required later on this year. So we, we're in the process of going through trade address rehearsals, change to CDS, uh, for everything we do, because our, our data is already CDS compliant, because we're doing it in Ireland and North Ireland. Uh, we're a very scalable operation because we have the robotics that we, if we max out on capacity, we always put with the robots always in the background, and probably about 75% of the data processing we do today. And I'm really careful using those words, not 75% of the customs entries necessarily, but 75% of the data processing that we do today is done with robotics. Some of that is full entry right the way through with data being that MRN back to us because it's a very regular robotic repetitive process before RPA. This is why we issued the RPA, the robotic, robotic process automation, repetitive process automation. Uh, we've got this expert technical core. I mean, there's been a real challenge for us getting the chemistry right that as we add people, it, the chemistry is not affected. And we, we've done that really well, I have to say. It's been one of the most rewarding things of what we've done is that we've got a bit of a launch party in the next couple of weeks because of COVID, we've not been able to do it before. So we've got a hotel on a Sunday and there's 130 of us going. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it because with the shift work, you don't often get everybody in the same room at the same time. So it should be fun. So don't ship in that day that we don't get we, we are covering it, don't we? Um, we're trying to be very innovative with the way we handle data. Uh, and also we're partnering up with uh, Fujitsu on the DTS project, which is the digital trader service. So we support the entry declaration system and it gets stuck in the mud, we unstick it. Um, but back to data. Data for us is the biggest, is the big thing. That's what needs to happen. Data is the most important element of what we do. So we try to get the data capture as slick as we can, because I can't, we can't do an entry by making stuff up. Why are you looking at a lorry and saying, oh, I reckon it's full of wood? And work like that. We've got to get the data, we've got to get the origins. So as much as possible we put in um, systems that allow uh, intuitive data capture so that when, as you're putting data in it's telling you whether or not that's likely to be good data. Also if for example you put in that the goods are coming from France, they're coming, they're coming from, or sorry they're going from GB to Ireland and the country of origin is France, our data capture immediately say I do you want to claim return for to leave for this please give me the MRN number. So it's got all of those kind of traps in it, or tricks and traps in it, so that we don't 
We don't encounter the problem later on in the process, we encounter it right at the front end. But the, the most of the job that we're doing at the moment is to say we like our data capture, only we want it to be ingested as part of step one to four rather than input as step five. Uh, and we're doing a lot of heavy work on that in the background. Taking lovely, clean, crisp shape. Um, it's taking a little bit longer because we want to get it right because the RPA process is working today. It's been replicated a lot by a lot of people, which is fine. We don't mind. Um, but once, uh, but if we keep it up to date, sorry, it needs to be kept up to date. And of course, if somebody replicates it or copies it, and we had it done, they won't necessarily keep it up to date. Whereas our portal will be constantly up to date. But equally, it might be record, you won't be able to replicate it. So there's all kinds of trips and triggers in there, and we're now working quite heavily on a, an interface with TMS. So we're interfacing to transport management systems because doing the declaration is all well and good, but the, vehicle, the vehicle's on the move. And remember, we're now very conscious of the frontier and the moving vehicle piece. So we want to make sure that we're talking to TMS systems uh, much sooner in the process. So again, we're we're kind of running in parallel to the physical movement of the goods, so the fiscal side is just running alongside without getting in the way. I drew this slide just the other day, actually, because we thought, so how, how connected are we then? So, and we've, we've drawn this kind of slide before and said, if you give me the data, there's so many things we can do with that data in terms of customs declarations of border processes. So what are we connected to? What can we do with that data? But if data comes into us through the portal, through even through the RPA today, we're hooked up to all the Irish systems, the European systems that we need to be hooked up to, including the uh, fabulous network of European agents and the part of the customs clearance consortium. And I did say I'd have a shout out for Lucas Winkowski in Poland, so because he couldn't make it today. So hello Lucas when you watch this on the recording. There, that's lot in Poland sorted. Uh, and then in the UK, all of that lot. It looks like a whole load of bunting, but this is the connectivity. We're not alone. There's a lot of agencies who do this. And, and the, what the market sees is like, hey, it's an entry of customs. Look at those connections. You know, there, are, there are AIS, AEP, DAFM, there are so many of them. It's a TMS and transport management systems. And we're doing that in a constant backwards and forwards motion. And we're doing it. So this slide for us is busy. Because it's busy, there's a lot to do. Now, the trick here is to be connected to all of these processes so that you can handle a, a, a process no matter where it is, but then knowing which ones to use. So for example, we don't use all of them all of the time, but if, for example, you had a, a GB to Ireland, they're the buttons we press for GB to Ireland. We know that, it's all embedded in our process. If it's Ireland to GB, they're the buttons we press. But again, we know that process, we know it's in there. Um, this is why we always ask for the direction of flow within uh, within the data capture so that if we know what your direction is so for example you can't say i'm going from uh, gb to dublin you go okay how are you getting there ireland will be most complicated in this piece because there's so many different ways of getting to somewhere uh, and if they're coming in through the north we're going to do this declaration they're going to the south it's going to be this way uh, similarly in mainland europe actually if you're shipping to calais you're going to holland you're going to need to do one of these if you're going if you're going to holland and you're shipping to rotterdam we're going to do one of these so it, the trick of the agent is to know what's required at what time and the import the export or import declaration is just one of the elements don't ever think it's the whole damn thing because it isn't there's a whole load of other stuff going in the background so, well the takeaways really are new simplifications that we you know start with the fact that you're going to use a simplification and then convince yourself that you don't need it rather than you do okay so start from the premise. CFSP, it's, it is popular, it's there for a reason. 75% of the volume was on CFSP. If you if you have your own CFSP approval, fantastic, happy days, don't forget about the frontier, because that's easy to sit there in an ivory tower somewhere saying, oh, we do our own declarations, don't forget about the frontier, because the frontier is coming. At the moment, you can do what you're doing, because the frontier doesn't particularly exist. Once the frontier exists, you can't do what you were doing before, because you've still got the frontier piece to consider. OK, and even if you say, well, I can, I just give that reference number to the Hornier. Don't forget the ENS. He needs some data to do the safety and security declaration. And it's your Iori number isn't enough. Okay? He needs more data than that. So don't leave your logistic operator high and dry here. Try and when we say keep it simple, try and reduce the number of touch points you have. So don't appoint a load of agents, but also be mindful of the fact that 
if you have your own, if you go to one agent, go back to that GVMS piece, if that, um, that agent's got to be able to interact with the logistics operator, so, there's a, so that the logistics operator can do the GVMS and the ENS documents, he doesn't want to be fishing around 20, 30 agents to get there. So there's a lot of transport and logistics operators that say, we won't carry it unless we clear it. And I get it, it's not because they want to take more money, it's that they need the control, they need the control, the truck's not going anywhere. It's a pound a minute to delay the truck. So they might charge you 45 pounds for the declaration, but they're looking at a pound a minute. If they don't, they're going to sit it somewhere. The other one that comes up actually is, and I heard this the other day from the freight forwarder, and I think it's a really good idea, is there is if the, if the freight forwarder is carrying the goods and they're doing the declaration for you because of the control aspect, then they'll sort out the GVMS, they'll sort out the ENS, they'll do what needs doing to get the goods to you. Okay? If you if you're sitting back saying, oh, we have our own agent, we do this, do this ourselves, so please speak to this guy, speak to that guy. Uh, this particular freight forward I was talking to you said we're going to charge £25 for the GM, GVMS declaration, which is honestly not worth £25. It's not, it's not £25 worth of work, but again, it's not the point, it's the control. So if somebody's saying I can get my entry done for 20 quid, so I'm going to use that guy just 20 quid, it's because you're only looking at the customs entry and you're forgetting the control. So now suddenly if the forwarder says, well, I need 25 quid to chase you for that information, then now suddenly your customs declaration is 45 quid, and the forwarder is sitting there at 40, so let me do this. Just think about it. Talk to your logistics provider. That's actually our last point, but talk to the logistics provider. Don't forget the frontier. It's coming, and your current process needs to be frontier ready, not just customs ready. Okay? This is where we, we always say that we deal with customs and borders. To say you deal with customs is not enough. It's just not enough. It's like doing a bad return, but not actually doing any trade. Okay, you, if you can't get through the frontier, there's no requirement for, for the customs declaration because you're, you're not here. Okay? And keep your logistics provider in the loop. Don't get all clever on them. You can try and do something your own way um, because it's working today and therefore you're going to ram it home next year. Is that think about that truck. That truck's got to negotiate a frontier. There may be the terms of delivery and also consider the Inco terms here is that the terms might be that the transport company is working for the French exporter, is the terms of DAP. So he has a relationship with the French exporter. He doesn't have a relationship with you as the GB importer. You're just a delivery address to him. Now you're a real problem to him because he can't get to you without the entry details of the import declaration that you're doing. And he just becomes the, the enemy in all of this piece because he's his customer in France is saying, why don't you deliver my goods? So because your customer won't give me the reference number for me to get through the frontier. These things are coming. We were always talking about this before day one. My fear is people think Brexit's done. This is just a run up. Okay, It starts on the 1st of January. Right, last slide. And we're a bit ahead of time, actually, which is unlike me, to be fair. Um, we, we, we did a, we've done a test or a quiz. I call it, it's not a test, it's a quiz. But we've had about a thousand responses to it. It's good fun. Look, it's quite techy. Uh, it's on our website, uh, uh, already, uh, slash quiz. Uh, it's also on the main homepage, it flashes you to the quiz. And it's it's the kind of things we get asked every day, or a customs agent gets asked every day. And it challenges you to say, to, as a multiple choice, what do you think the answer is? Um, I'd say we've had about a thousand responses to that quiz so far. You, you can count the number of 10 out of 10s on one hand. And a couple of those are quite spurious, to be fair, is that once you've done the test, you get the test answers. And then we've seen people log back in and do the test again and get 10. So if that's your life, then fine. But you're literally just copying the answers. We also saw somebody who downloaded the answers and then went back on and got nine. <laughs> so they couldn't even read the answers correctly. But it's a bit of fun, but it is actually quite useful. We use it even for our own uh, training identification, whereas if people are, because uh, we also see the patterns, who's getting the right, the, the sort of questions wrong regularly. So give it a go. We do, we update it every now and then, but honestly, it's, it's worth a go just for the fun. And use your Gmail account if you want to, but nobody knows how you did. Apart from other course, we don't know. Um, and then I was asked actually yesterday by a good friend of mine, says, what, what's your mantra? What is the, what's the mission statement of, of Iori? And it comes from Matt, our finance director, and it's very simple. And it's not extremely effective. Is our complete mission statement is to save a pair of hands. That's just that we want all of our members, 
the team to be a safe pair of hands for us so we can give them a task and it gets done. We want to be a safe pair of hands for our clients. We want to be a safe pair of hands for the data and the security of that. So everything we do is based on us becoming a safe pair of hands. And thank you for listening. That is the end of our Brexit and next year. I hope it's helped. As I said, we will be recording this and circulating the YouTube video of it. I'm sorry if it's a bit punchy. It might not relate to you because you might be doing everything in preparation for 2022, but our experience has shown that that's often not the case. Hence the reason why we're a little bit punchy, I'm afraid, in that we've been nice for so long and nothing's happening, so we decided to be a bit more nasty. Um, but consider the frontier. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day. I've actually given you five minutes of your life back because we thought we'd finish at 12. And uh, thank you again for listening and for taking the time to find the link after I've read it. Thank you. Bye.